Uh, today we're in chapter 1. I am going to look at verses 5 through 10 here in 1 Thessalonians. Let's read beginning at verse 5. We'll read to verse 10, and prayerfully I will get to verse 10. I'm not sure that I will. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, as we begin, let me lay a foundation. We're going to be looking at the power of the gospel, obviously, when we have opportunity to uh, take time to look at a New Testament book, especially we have opportunity to see how God works and how God works through His Spirit and by His Word and all. But I want to lay a foundation so we can see some things uh, this evening as it relates to the sharing of our faith. I want you to note, notice, even as we begin, how Paul refers to the gospel in verse 5 as our gospel. Notice that with me. He begins in verse 5 by saying, For our gospel did not come to you in word only. Our gospel. Now the word gospel is used some 55 times in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, it is a word that is used especially of what we call the glad tidings, the glad tidings of the coming kingdom of God. It speaks concerning the salvation that is obtained through Jesus Christ, and it also speaks concerning those things that pertain to salvation. This word gospel. Gospel message, the message of joy, the great news. God has done something for us through Jesus Christ. A message that speaks of how to be saved and what happens once you are saved. It's all found within what is called the gospel. But when Paul is speaking here, notice again in verse 5, notice how he says, our gospel. One would have to ask the question, what do you mean? What do you mean when you refer to the gospel as our gospel? You see, there are those who would say that the apostle Paul was the was actually the one who originated this message. They would say that Paul is actually claiming to be the originator of this message called the gospel. But that's not what Paul is speaking about at all. He's not saying that the gospel originated with him because Paul is the one who communicated to us that this gospel message originates with God himself. It isn't a message that was created and invented by Paul or any other man. This message called the gospel is a message that God has given to us. It is a message God has communicated to us. And Paul would no way say that he was the originator of this message of salvation. As a matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he said this. He said, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul is speaking about this message called the gospel, but it's not saying that it originated with him. By calling it our gospel, he's simply making it clear that it is not of human origin. The gospel is a message of God's saving grace, a message of saving grace that is made available to us through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's a message that not all people willingly necessarily receive. As a matter of fact, he would tell the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So there is a, a common response that many have for this gospel message, and that is to reject it because it makes no sense to them. So Paul is saying this is a message of salvation, and he would also include in other letters that there are those who would reject it, but this message did not originate with him. It wasn't created by man. So by referring to this gospel as our gospel, he's simply making it very clear that he also partook in its blessings. The gospel is good news to all sinners. And Paul included himself in sinful humanity. He didn't 
accept himself. He didn't exempt himself from it. He's basically saying, our gospel is a message that first came to me, that I'm a sinner in need of God's saving grace, that God did a work in my life to transform me, and he did this through the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom, he said, I am chief. So he was an individual who with humility knew that he needed to partake in the salvation and blessings offered to him by God through Jesus Christ in this message of the gospel. He was saved by the same message that he was declaring to other people. So we partake in salvation. We receive. That which we have received, that is what we give. We have received this message of the gospel by faith. We have said, yes, Lord, forgive me a sinner. And God has. God changed my life, transformed me from the inside. God has. And so as those who have partaken in the water of life, we have the ability to communicate this same message to other people. Like he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, since we have this ministry, as we have received, ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We receive mercy ourselves. And it's the mercy that we've received that causes us to have humility of heart and mind to be able to give this same message to other people. This partaking in a gospel message, obviously, has been very important to me, first as a Christian and as one who serves the Lord in, in ministry. And as a pastor, I remember that I'm a sinner saved by grace. I also know that I'm a member of the church that I pastor. And... When you bring the word from that vantage, it actually helps you to have something that is necessary if you're going to communicate this word properly, and that would be humility. Because you cannot have this attitude of, that I've seen in the past uh, of looking at somebody else and even looking down on them and, and wondering out loud, how can you be the way that you are? How can you do the things that you do? Because... The things that others have done, we've done, and sometimes we've done even worse. We have our testimonies, don't we? We have the testimony that we proclaim openly and in public, and many people know our testimony. And then we have the real one, the one that we don't share with anybody else. The elements of that testimony that are never open publicly to anybody else, that we would not want anybody else to know. We wouldn't want them to know what we really have been, what we really have done. So we share the things that we think are enough for people to understand that God has incredible grace, but we experience the depth of his grace because we know exactly what we are and because we know what we've been and what we've done and we don't forget those things. It produces within us a sense of gratitude and it ought to awaken in us a sense of humility because what people have done, we have done ourselves. And sometimes we have done even worse. So Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. He understood the magnitude of God's grace and it was from that vantage point that he would share the love and the mercy and the goodness of God with other people. Now as somebody who has partaken in this ministry of the gospel, I want you to notice how he says here in verse 5, concerning our gospel. Notice how he said, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. Our gospel did not come to you. That's the second thing I want to point out here. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message that is taken out. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not meant to remain in a church pew. It's meant to be taken to the world. The message of the gospel is intended to be taken and proclaimed, to be lived out and given to others. When the Lord was speaking on one occasion to a, a lawyer who approached him, and the lawyer said, what is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He said, this is the first and the greatest commandment, but there's a second like unto it. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, he said, hang all the law 
and the prophets. What is the great commandment? Love God with all of your heart. But how do I know that I'm loving God with all of my heart? Well, if you love God whom you have not seen, you will also love your brother whom you have seen. So your faith is going to be demonstrated not just by you giving and, and by you praying and by you fasting and by you doing all the liturgically correct things, the religiously right things, but your true faith is going to be demonstrated by the love you have for other people, by the concern you have for other people's well-being, by that sense of devotion to ministering to them and helping them, especially as they have times of need. And so a love is, is, is what motivates us to care for other people. Now, if I really love a person, if I really love a person, then I'm going to be honest with them and I'm going to share with them and I'm going to be open about what would be best for them in their life. And what would be best for them in their life would be a faith in Jesus Christ. We live in a society that's very open about the things that we love, aren't we? I was driving here just the other day, and as I was driving to church, I saw a young man driving past me with his pickup truck and his Lakers flag. As it was just, you know, in, in the breeze, he's going to have to take that flag down pretty soon. can use it to wash his windows, but I was. <laughs> but he's pretty open about it. This guy loves the Lakers, and that's, that's okay with me. You can love the Dodgers. You can even love the Angels. You better not love SC, but you can love a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things, and you do so openly, and you do so openly. And, and our friends know that if you enjoy a restaurant, if you really enjoy a restaurant, you probably will let your friends know about it. You probably will. If you like a coffee shop, you'll say, you ought to try drip over here. It's pretty good. Or you'll say, you ought to go to this place here. It's pretty good. That's what friends do, right? We, we invite friends to go to places and enjoy the things that we like. And we're real open to that. And why would I tell my friends that? Well, because I've enjoyed something and I want them to enjoy it along with me. I want them to have the same pleasure that I have. And, and when I got saved, I have to be honest with you, that's just something that transferred into my life. I want you to know about Jesus Christ. I want you to know what God has done. I want you to be aware of the fact that God can do a work in your life. It was something very normal, something very natural. It was something that was obviously fairly easy. You just tell people what God has done in your life. You just share, this is what God's all about. And you invite them to enjoy Jesus Christ. Like was earlier mentioned, like Matthew, the tax gatherer who gets saved. And the first thing he does is he invites people over to his home. He gives them a meal, invites Jesus and turns Jesus loose on them to share of his love and his goodness. But that's what you do. You just become an inviter. You just become an indiv individual who's open with what God has done and a willingness to share. That's the heart of, of the movement that I came out of, a movement that today people who write concerning trends in the church call the Jesus movement. That's the movement I came out of. That's my DNA. That's my heritage. Coming out of the hippie lifestyle, living counterculturally, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, being willing to be rejected because hippies were not liked by everybody, and yet saying that Jesus Christ is worth being rejected for if I will be rejected, counting the cost and beginning to share. But that was just part of our DNA. That was what God called us to do. We were encouraged to, to take this message of Christ, to live it and to give it, to share it with other people to let them know how good God is and what God can do in a person's life. And to be willing to say, this is where I was at, but this is where I've been brought by Jesus Christ. To be willing to do that. That's in our DNA. We have been commanded to share our faith with other people. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus said, Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So as new believers, we share that God saved us. We became living lights to those who are living in darkness. 
Like it says in Matthew 4, 16, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light, and upon those who sat in region and shadow of death, light has dawned. We were the individuals who were seated there in a region of death and darkness, but the light shone upon us, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And, and what made that moment in history so revolutionary is we did basically what John Wesley once said when John Wesley said, catch on fire and others will love to come watch you burn. And that's what happened. We were on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and it drove us to take the chance to share our new faith with everybody that we loved. On the day I was saved, I shared with my sister Madeline what the Lord had done in my life, December 27, 1970. And I shared with her, this is what God has done. And that same day, as you all know, my sister Madeline went to bed that night, put her head on a pillow and said, whatever you did to, to my brother Jesus, I want you to do that for me. And that's how she got saved. It was just a natural outpouring. Within three weeks, because I'd been taught, you need to read the Bible. I began to read through the New Testament. I got to the book of Revelation, chapter 9. And I started reading about men with women's hair and iron teeth and scorpion stings and wanting to die. And, and it freaked me out. So I went into the kitchen where mom and dad were, and they were seated there at the kitchen table as they normally did. They would sit and they would visit, and I walked in and I held the Bible. I said, Mom, Dad, this is the Word of God. Listen to what God has to say. And I read Revelation 9. And then I gave my first real Bible study. I said, I don't know what this means. <laughs> but I do know this. It's not speaking to me. It's speaking to you. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, you're a good man. You are the best man I will ever know but you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. Daddy, I love you, and I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head and pray. You're going to receive Christ as your Savior right now. And you all know the story. My dad and my mom both bowed their heads and gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. Now, what motivated me to go and speak to my father in such a way? I was raised in a way that you respect your father, you never speak strongly to him, you most certainly don't address sins that he may have. What is it that drove me to do that? The love of Jesus Christ constrains you. The desire to see them saved motivates you. And you share from the abundance of your heart the love of Christ with them. That's how they got saved. My brother Frank, I have an ugly brother named Frankie. My brother Frank got saved three and a half years later in August of 1974. And because he didn't have a church Bible study that he could go to, I began to drive out to Ontario from Norwalk. And I would come and I would teach my brother Frankie the Gospel of Matthew. And as I began to share with him, beginning in September of 1974, he began to invite friends. And one of the friends that he invited to this home Bible study was a young woman named Marie Lopez. And when Marie showed up, some idiot called her on the phone. Some guy. He's not alive anymore. I made sure of that. But he called. <laughs> and I heard her giggling on the phone. And I didn't know this girl from Adam or Eve. She came and sat down started whispering to her friend, her roommate. She's all excited, and from out of nowhere, a thought entered my mind, and that was, I'm going to make her giggle about me someday. I didn't even know this girl. It turns out after the Bible study, she wasn't saved. I sat down. She comes to talk to me. She was going to college. She asked me a question. She says, what's your sign? That was the big icebreaker back then, you guys, for you, for you young people. That was the icebreaker. And I said, the fish. And she goes, oh, you're a Pisces. 
I said, no, the ichthus. I said, I don't go for that astrology nonsense. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Two weeks later, Marie gave her heart to Jesus Christ to the ministry of my sister Madeline, who was my first convert to faith in Christ. And Marie, as everybody knows, needed to be discipled, so I dated her and married her very quickly. <laughs> Didn't want that one to get away. She became my girlfriend and then she became my wife. In 1998, my youngest sister, Rebecca, well, after being in bondage to lesbianism for 28 years, my sister Rebecca gave her heart to Jesus Christ at an invitation I gave on an Easter Sunday here in this church. Love people enough to tell them the truth. Tell them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If Jesus has been good to you, can't he be good to somebody else too? It's been said that the most selfish person on the face of the earth is the one who goes to heaven alone. What God has called us to do is to give this good news out to other people and to share with them. You see, you see today people speak of this Jesus movement as if it's a footnote in church history, as if this Jesus movement has passed. But this movement hasn't passed. In 1970, there was only one Calvary Chapel. Today, there are over 1,500 Calvary Chapels. God is still moving. Do you know that since January to this month, since January to now in April, we have seen 296 people answer invitations in this church? Almost 300 people have given their faith to Jesus Christ in the last few months. We see that happen. The movement of the Spirit continues. Some of the Calvary Chapel ministries are the largest in the nation. God has done a work, and God wants to continue to do the work. God wants to do that work through us. God wants to do that work through you. Every one of us has friends and family, co-workers and neighbors who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. All we need to do is just ask the Lord to give us opportunity, fill us with his spirit, and give him opportunity to work through us. Now, he says our gospel did not come to you, continuing in word only. The gospel is not a compilation of thoughts. It's not simply personal testimonies and experience, and it's certainly not simply a, a religious ritual that we bring be people into bondage to. He's saying it's God's word. It didn't come to you in word only, and we gave you this word with conviction. Oswald Chambers once said, we must never confuse our desire for people to accept the gospel with creating a gospel that is acceptable to people. So he says, we, br we brought a message to you that was not tainted by human wisdom and human invention. The, the, the word of God is like a lion that you let out of the cage. You let the word do what the word of God can do. And that's why he said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we gave you the gospel without compromise, without alteration. And the reason we did so is because it is God's word. And when embraced by faith and acted upon, it enables change to occur within us. These people became Christians. They were receptive to the message of the gospel. And this gospel came in power. The works of the Spirit through the miracles and all that were taking place just validated the power of this message. But the gospel came, he says, in the work of the Holy Spirit. People were touched by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If I can talk somebody into accepting Christ, somebody else can talk them out of walking with Christ. But when the Holy Spirit does his work of conviction, when the Holy Spirit grabs you from the inside, and there's this, an aware, this awareness that this is the Lord God who's touching me right now, well, that's a work of the Spirit of God. The message of the gospel appeals to people, and it causes them from the inside to desire change. The Holy Spirit brings conviction upon people who are held in spiritual bondage. And that's why we continue to communicate the simple message of the gospel, because the gospel, when received, 
will transform a life. Now he says this gospel came in much assurance. This speaks of a confidence in which he presented the gospel to them. He didn't give them the impression that there was another way to God. I don't come up here in this pulpit and say to you, I really think that Jesus Christ is really great, but you know, if you want to go with Buddha or, or Confucius or Muhammad or whatever, that's up to you. We don't believe that at all, do we? We believe that there is one way to God, and that's Jesus Christ. There's one message that God ever gave to us called the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation. And so we present the gospel as it is. Why? Because it's the power of the gospel that will change you. And so we speak it with confidence. The only reason people don't speak it with confidence is, one, is they may not, be, they have, may not have experienced how God comes to the rescue when they're trying to, to present him to others. And so they're tongue-tied and a little afraid. They don't know what to say. They don't open their mouth because they're afraid they're going to make a mistake and therefore they remain silent because the enemy basically through the culture and, and through spiritual uh, kinds of things can, can encourage them to, to be quiet, to shut up, to not say anything because you don't want to offend. I just didn't have that problem. I just really believed and still do quite obviously that this message needs to be embraced. God says it in his word nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. So we speak confidently because we know and believe this message. We speak confidently because we've experienced the salvation and the freedom that comes through relationship with Christ. We speak confidently because we've seen God do that same work in other people. Transforms you, gives you strength. He's with you even in your darkest hour. Paul, for example, and Silas are preaching a message. Demon-possessed soothsayer begins to follow them in the city of Philippi. And begins to basically be Satan's publicity agent. These men bring the way of salvation. Listen to them. Paul, greatly annoyed, turns and says to the demon within this woman, come out of her. Well, she had brought great profit to those who had utilized her quote-unquote services, and they got upset. They said that Paul was creating a disturbance in the city, and Paul and Silas end up being put in a jail cell. First they're beaten, then they're put in the stocks. The Bible tells us at midnight they were singing praises to God. And as this has taken place, a Philippian jailer is there, Scripture tells us that he began a conversation with Paul and he asked the question, Sirs, how can I be saved? You have something that I don't have. In the midst of your trial, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your suffering, you have something that causes you to sing in a jail cell. And that Philippian jailer knew that he was in a greater cell than Paul and Silas because though their freedom had been taken away from them, their liberty in Christ hadn't been. And though they were unable to move at that moment to be where they wanted to, they were in the exact right place. And therefore, they had joy and were capable of sharing from that position of what God can do in somebody's life. And this jailer who had the freedom to leave and to come as he willed saw a difference between them and himself. And that's why he says to them, what must I do to be saved? And the answer coming from Paul, very basic and very simple. Give as much money as you can. No. Pray as long as you can. No. Crawl on broken glass. No. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved in your household. And that man gave his heart to Christ. They brought the message to the family. They received the Lord Jesus Christ. See, God has a way of working by his message in our lives to not just save us, but to be conduits of his grace to other people. That's how God works, you see? Now, in verse 6, he says, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so you became followers of us and of the Lord. They recognized Paul's message. They recognized his manner of life, and it was worth imitating. Even like he had said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And yet following Jesus exacts a great price. They were persecuted. They had turned the back from idols, were believers in the living God. But even though they went through these things, they became examples to others, and they saw the truth and veracity of the message. We had a man come and share with us one time here in this fellowship. It's been many years now. Most, if not almost all of you were not here. Some of you were when this took place. His name is Moses Paulos. He's from India. And he came and he shared with us and all. And I had met him when I was on a ministry trip in India many years ago now. Moses Paulos. He really convicted the women. I'll never forget that because of a story he gave. He shared how that his wife, her birthday was approaching and Moses had approached his wife and said to her, honey, what would you like for your birthday? And her answer was a bullhorn so that she could stand on street corners there in the city that they lived in in India and preach the gospel. Well, when he said, what would you like for your birthday, our American women were sitting here thinking, oh, some shoes, you know, or whatever, purses. And so when they heard a bullhorn, you know, you could almost hear a pin drop. The conviction was so heavy. And all the husbands were going, yeah, thank you, Moses. But <laughs> you delivered me. But he was very impressive, very impressive with his love for Jesus Christ. I heard a story, though, that occurred, a true story, with Moses and his son. I had met his son when his son was a little boy. And his son had grown older at this time and began to accompany his father on missions trips. They had received an invitation to come to a particular village that was known for its occultism. And so he th saw that as a sign from the Lord, thought it a good thing, and he and his son went to this village. But it was a trap. It had been a setup for him. So when he arrived in the village, he was set upon by some of these very fanatic Hindus who were very upset at him preaching the gospel. They took rods and beat him severely. And they beat his son almost to death. They tied both Moses and his son to a tree and beat him on the, in this tree. Then they sent for a village skinner to come and skin him alive. But providentially that man who did that kind of deed was not there so they severely beat them to the point where they could hardly move untied them released them and Moses was taken back to his village his son almost died had severe internal injuries he almost died but when he healed up he went back to the village with his son when he went walking back into the village to bring the gospel to these people who almost killed him, when he came into the village, they were waiting for him. And they came running and said to him, we've been waiting for you to come back because ever since we treated you the way that we did, bad things have happened to us. They took him to the tree that he had been tied to, which was the oldest tree in the village, which was used for their sacrifices and it had died. It had withered up and died. And they said, we know that we have upset your God for the way we treated you. Please tell us about your God. Moses was able to proclaim the message of the gospel to them, planted a church there, has a pastor there, and God used that even in that beating. Paul is speaking and saying, you turned from dead idols to the living God, and you became a testimony of the power of God for transformation. So much so that we don't even have to proclaim things because a message is coming through you. See, that's how it works. You receive the word of God and you take it out. You share it in such a way that people listen. And God's word continues to go forth and to bear fruit. And the fruit here in their case was that they followed the Lord Jesus Christ, became examples of believers, and the word of God began to sound out from them. 
They turn from idolatry, which would be obvious of a transformation. They turn from sin and turn to the Lord. Their lives changed. They serve the living God in opposition to dead idols. So no longer did they just talk about God, but they actually served the living God and became his servants. And finally, they waited for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ with a sustained anticipation. Jesus is coming back. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. They waited patiently in him because they have their hope in him. They aren't going to enter into tribulation. They don't enter into the eternal damnation. They have life with Christ. He delivers us from the wrath to come. That's the anticipation that serves as motivation for us to take this message to other people. Do you have somebody in your life, somebody that you know, that you love, who doesn't know Jesus Christ, who doesn't have a relationship with God? Pray for them. Put them on that little list and pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Like my friend Bill, who walked away from the Lord in 1971, remained away from God for 38 years. Shows up in church when I'm doing a baptism. I hadn't seen him for some time. Tells me that he came to see me because he had been in the Middle East, and he was training uh, some police officers in 120-degree weather, wearing 60 pounds of gear. He was in his late 50s at that time, and he said, I was inside of my tent, and I started asking myself, what am I doing here? I need to get out of here. So he said, I did something I haven't done in a long time. I prayed. He said, and I said, started making promises to God. And one of the promises I made was, I'll come and see David if you get me out of the Middle East. And he says, and so within a couple of weeks, he got out. They released him. And he came and saw me. And at that point, he wasn't walking with the Lord. At that point, he was still rejected and didn't even remember that there was a time when he even claimed to be a Christian. And from that point, he and I began to meet on a monthly basis with another friend of ours. And within about two years of just meeting with him and sharing with him and answering his questions, I finally asked him, so Bill, where are you with Jesus now? And he said to me, I've received him as my Lord and Savior. And he's been walking with the Lord now for over two and a half years. And even as I speak right now, he's in Israel having a pilgrimage, spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ because his life was transformed. I prayed for him for 30-some years for the Lord to reach down and touch my dear friend again, a friend that I've had since I was five years old. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. He listens to you as you cry out. Who do you have in your life that you think is so far gone they can't be saved? Well, just remember, that was you in somebody else's sight not that long ago. They would have said that about you. They'd have said, Dave Rosales? No way. Crazy, drug-abusing alcoholic. No way. But David Rosales sits here, stands here today saying, Jesus Christ is Lord because somebody prayed for me and somebody prayed for you and you are now praying for somebody else. And may your life be a testimony of turning from the dead things like idolatry, anything that takes the place of God, to the living God who gives to you a life eternal through Jesus Christ. That's what God has called us to.